I'm going to open up in Genesis 12. We'll go to four different passages in Genesis. But let me open up in a passage of Scripture that we're pretty familiar with around here. I actually preached this passage in a different uh, message not too terribly long ago. But let's look in Genesis chapter 12. If you didn't bring a copy of the Scriptures, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, and it'll be up on the screen behind me, and it says this. Genesis 12.1. Now Yahweh said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot, that's his nephew, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarah, Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. And here we go. So he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Altar number one out of four that I want to share with you. When we're talking about altars, I think this is the place where all of us need to begin. And I want to make sure you understand I'm not talking about physical altars. We often call these steps right here, come to the altar. When we sang come to the altar earlier, it has a local church paradigm sometimes of coming forward. But frankly, this really isn't an altar. It becomes an altar to you privately when you do something intentional with the Lord there. But an altar is not so much in our day about stones or marble or um, artifacts or anything like that. An, An altar is anywhere you are where you're pressing into the presence of God and he's increasing in you and you're decreasing. And so this is where it begins. I call this the altar of initial surrender. I don't have a lot of notes today. I asked the Lord to just give a a little bit of a prophetic unction today so I can speak to us where we are. But I want to remind you of the circumstances of Abram at this time. Abram was a pagan. Abram was a man who lived in the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, and he worshiped a lot of gods, the gods of his age, the gods of his culture. He was just an average citizen in his culture. And by the sovereign electing grace of God, God said, Abram, I choose you and I'm going to bless you and through you, I'm going to bless the entire world. There was nothing that Abram did, nothing. God chose Abram. And Abram responded to the voice of the Lord. And this is what the Lord told him. Abram, I'm calling you to leave everything you know. I'm calling you to say goodbye to your homeland. I'm calling you to say goodbye to your family. I'm calling you to say goodbye to the gods that you've grown up with. I'm calling you to say goodbye to your career. I'm calling you to say goodbye to your home. I'm calling you to say goodbye to your land. I'm calling you to say goodbye to your life work. I'm calling you to walk away from all of that. And I want you to follow me to a place that I'll tell you about when you start walking. And it was an initial call of deep faith. Now, that sounds exciting to those of you that are 25 in the room. Abraham was 75. Abraham was an old man. He was on the back end of what physically uh, would have been the, the, the last chapters of his life. And God says, now it's time to start living for me, Abram. I love that because what it tells all of us is it's never too late to start doing the right thing. It's never too late to start responding to God. No matter what gods you've worshipped, no matter how deep you are in the world, no matter how committed you are to the life that you've lived up to this point, no matter how successful you are, no matter how much family you have, how deep your stakes are in the ground, it's never too late to start listening to God when God starts calling you. And what this altar is going to come to represent is this initial surrender. So it starts with this, a calling to trust and obey the voice of the Lord. A calling to hear what the Lord is saying in the moment. And when God does that, he says, Abram, as you follow me, here's the promises that I'm making unto you. 
Here's what, yes, Abram, you're going to be leaving some things. You're going to be declining some things. You're going to be separating from some things. But Abram, I want you to know, I have something more. I have something better on the pathway of obedience and trust if you will follow me. And of course, that's the Abrahamic covenant. I'm not going to go into that. But ultimately, God said, through you, Abram, I'm going to develop a people that are going to be innumerable throughout history. And through your lineage is going to come the Messiah who's going to bless the entire world. That's the very condensed version. And so what did Abram do? Well, he packed up and he left. He left everything he knew. When he gets to the land, I mean, God didn't say, Abram, here's the GPS coordinates. Go ahead, get in your Tesla, just press go. You'll get there and boom, everything's going to happen. He just says, Abram, leave everything you know, start walking, pack up, start walking. I'll tell you where you're going as you go. Uh, just very quickly here, that preach is good, but it's hard to live. It's the Lord equivalent of saying, I want you to lay your familiarity on the altar. Everything you've leaned upon, everything you've trusted upon, every person that's been important to you, I want you to lay them on the altar because I've got plans for you. And if that's me, I raise my hand. I said, Lord, that's awesome. Go ahead and tell me exactly what we're going to do and let me pray about it, Right? And that's not trust. That's negotiation. And God doesn't bless negotiation. God honors trust. And so Abram starts going, and when he gets there to the land that God has promised, when he gets there, there's no palace waiting on Abram. There's no welcoming committee. There's no tons of people saying, God has prepared us for your arrival. Come, this land now belongs to you. As a matter of fact, the scriptures say that at that time, there were Canaanites in the land. Big, scary, hairy, ugly men that kill people. And they're in Abram's territory. And Abram walks up and God hasn't immediately taken care of the enemy. God hasn't immediately given him a place to land. God hasn't immediately restored everything that Abraham said no to. Abram is now saying, okay, Lord, I'm in the place, but this doesn't look like what I envisioned. There's bad guys in the land. Why did you send me here? Now, the scripture doesn't say that. The scripture does not say that he actually said that, but reasoning, it would be, it would be reasonable to wonder that Abram, when he got there, is saying, I thought this place was mine. This doesn't look like mine at all. How many of you have learned that God can give you a word here that's ultimate fulfillment is here? And in between here and the ultimate fulfillment, there's this thing called faith and trust that is exemplified in obedience. And so as Abram gets there, God says, Abram, I want you to know how permanent this is. Abram, not only is this land yours, I'm going to give it to your offspring. And later amplifications of this covenant, God would say, and it will be theirs forever. Who are these people? Of course, it's the people of Israel. And to this very day, they occupy a good portion of that land that was committed to them. But that land and that territory that belongs to Israel will continue to grow. And in the millennial kingdom, Israel will occupy the full extent. But the initial promise was here. And when Abram got that reassurance, the Bible says it was then and there that he built his first altar to the Lord. When he heard and he trusted and he believed. In that moment where he had left everything and said, God, I'm all in. Initial trust and surrender right then and there. He literally took rocks and stones and built an altar under the tree, under that oak tree at Morah. By the way, most scholars think that that tree indicated a pagan grove. In other words, where all the pagans came to worship their fertility gods under the groves and in the trees. Abram said, okay, I've got a promises on my life. I'm 75 years old, but God has promised me offspring. If they're gonna raise up altars to their God for fertility, I'm going to raise up an altar under my God who will see his promises. I wonder if there's people in the room today that God's been tugging on you a little while and you've done like I confess that I've done at times, negotiated with God, waiting on God to make it crystal clear, waiting for guarantees in the natural, waiting for it all to make sense, waiting for everything to line up accordingly so then you can fully give yourself to it. And the Lord's just saying, I'm actually not going to give you that luxury because what I'm trying to develop in you is a sense of trust and not a further sense of you being in control of everything. So when he laid the rocks upon the, uh, one another and he backed away from that altar, Abraham sealed this moment and he said, all right, God, I barely know you, but this is a new beginning. This is a place of starting over. This is a place of no looking back, and I trust you. I feel like some in the room today 
need to come to that place. It may involve a first-time surrender to Jesus Christ. It may mean that you move from Southern Bible Belt cultural religion and Christendom into a life-transforming encounter with God Almighty through the blood of Jesus Christ, whereby you are saved, forgiven, and restored, filled with the Holy Spirit, and begin to walk anew. It could be that moment. There's people in the room today, listen, your inward gut, you're sick of religion. You're sick of Southern evangelicalism. You're sick of charismania. You're sick of all of the wrong or incomplete representations of who God is and what God has said and what Jesus does. You're tired of it. But instead of pressing in for the fullness, you're just pulling back and living in your state of dissatisfaction when God says, no, I revealed all of that to you so that you would never settle for that, but you'd press through that to find me. And some of you can do that today. But let's go a little further because that's just his first altar. The second one might appeal. I really felt the Lord and when I was preparing on the second altar. And I call it the altar of humble recommitment. Verses in Genesis 13 will be up on your screen. But just listen to these and I'll give you some background. This is a later time. So Abram's lived in the land. And then we read in Genesis 13. So Abram went up from Egypt. Now just mark that. We left him in Canaan. How did he get to Egypt? I'll explain it in a minute. Abram went up from Egypt. He and his wife and all that they had and Lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. Now this is an interesting place. So Abram's in the land and he builds that altar. That's where we left him a moment ago. He builds an altar of surrender, an altar of commitment, an altar of trust, an altar of obedience, an altar where he says, God, I'm all in. And then the Bible goes on to explain in the rest of chapter 12 that he starts moving around a little bit. They're trying to find a place to settle down a little bit. And he just lives in the land for a little while. But then a famine hits the land. It's the first test of what Abram laid down at that altar. It's the first test. By the way, you build an altar and lay something on it, it will be tested. And so Abram is tested here when the famine hits because Abram grew up in the Fertile Crescent. Abram grew up in lush vegetation. Abram grew up in a beautiful place. Now he's out in the middle of a foreign wasteland and he's trying to learn how to live. So the famine hits. And so Abram does what a lot of us do when trouble hits us. We start calculating, we start thinking, we start saying, God, I'll catch up with you in a minute, but let me figure some stuff out first. And Abram starts making decisions independent of the Lord and ultimately says, okay, what I need to do is I need to go down to Egypt. There's not a famine there. I'll go down to Egypt. We'll catch our breath. I'll I'll check back in in the promised land later, but I got to take care of myself right now. And so Abram takes Sarai and Lot and they move down into Egypt for a little while. But when Abram gets into Egypt, he backslides. I mean, moving to Egypt was backsliddenness. It was the initial thought of Abram no longer listening to the Lord. You don't find anywhere in there that he prayed, asked God what to do. He just reacted to the hardship, started leaning to his own understanding, and his own understanding led him into a place that God did not want him to go. But hallelujah, I'm going to tell you this, God's faithful even when you put yourself in a place where he doesn't want you to go. He doesn't give up on you. But Abraham is going to reap a little bit of what he sowed. So he gets down in there, and this is kind of cool. The Bible says, this, this, I'm not making this up, I'm not being cute or funny with it. Sarah, Sarai, is 65 years old, and the Bible says she's a knockout. Straight up, good looking, Vogue cover, a magazine, whatever you want. She is a knockout. And so as Abram's getting down there, they're moving into Egypt, he's feeling good about this fresh start, and he's realizing some dudes are checking out his wife. They're looking at her, and all you women know what that look is. When a dude's looking at you, and then Abram's like, they're looking at my woman. So he calls a huddle with Sarah, and he says, hey, this is what we're going to do. These guys are cutthroat. If, if they keep looking at you this way, it means they like you, and they're going to kill me, and they're going to take you. So, Sarai, I really need to protect myself. So tell everybody you're my sister and not my wife. Doesn't sound very heroic, does it? All the ladies are like, what a chump, man. What, what is he doing? So they get down in there, and indeed, word reaches Pharaoh. Pharaoh, this dude just came into town with this knockout woman. You need to add her to your harem. It's his sister. And so Pharaoh takes Sarai, puts her in the harem. Abraham's like, whew, that could have been dangerous for me. Meanwhile, he sold his wife out. 
And so there was in Egyptian culture a waiting period before the king would consummate any physical relationship with a woman in his harem. They wanted to make sure that she wasn't pregnant. So there would have been weeks. And during the weeks, God plagued the house of Pharaoh. He plagued the house. And everybody, all of the women in the harem, all the servants in the house, everybody was plagued except Sarah. So Pharaoh's a pretty smart guy, and he comes to the conclusion, sums up with that dude and his sister. And then word somehow comes to Pharaoh, and he finds out that Abram lied to him. Now, let me just give you this real quick. Abram had built an altar of God to God of trust, obedience, faithfulness, and surrender. But just right after that, he's taken back control. He's living in his own understanding. He's trying to calculate clever. He's not trusting God. He's protecting himself. He's literally putting his wife on the line, her testimony, her purity, her integrity. And then what he did actually incurred the anger of God against Pharaoh's house. And Pharaoh hadn't really done anything except just being the pagan that he was. And then, and all of a sudden, Abram's standing in the court of Pharaoh and Pharaoh, I'm summarizing, says, Why did you lie to me? This woman's your wife, not your sister. Now, by the way, Abraham had a slight technicality because Sarah was actually his half-sister. They're not from Alabama. Y'all don't, no, 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 no. no. (laughs) That was completely inappropriate. Um, But back back in Bible days, that was very common. Very common. He married his half-sister. So Abraham might have been saying, well, I didn't technically tell a lie, but Abraham knew what he was doing. He was, he was covering his own backside. And so what ends up happening is Pharaoh's like, I don't know about your God, but he is messing up my house. So I want you, your wife, your nephew, and everybody that came into town with you, I want you out of here. And in order to appease your God, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm Pharaoh. I'm going to bless you, Abraham. And he loaded up Abraham with livestock, with gold, with silver. That's what we read. That's where we read in chapter number 13. Abram went up from Egypt and all that he had, he was very rich. And like, he went down with nothing. He went down backslidden. He got humbled big time by the Lord. He came this close to blowing it. This close to reaping harsh re- reward or results, consequences from the, the things that he had said and done And yet on the way out, God said, Abram, I want you to know that I'm so good that even in your backsliddenness, now that you've repented, I'm still able and willing to bless you because I made some promises to you that will be fulfilled. And so Abram gets back up into and he revisits that altar that he had made. That's what it says in verse four, chapter 13. It says that he was between Bethel and Ai. By the way, very interesting word names there for those cities. Bethel means the house of God. Ai means the heap of ruins. And that's what it means to live backslidden. You're between the house of God and a heap of ruins. Abraham had said, no, I'm going back to Bethel. And he revisits that altar. And the Bible says that it was there that he began to call on the name of the Lord. Let me just give you this quick word. I don't even consider this prophetic. I consider it more pastoral. This is a great time of year for everybody to consider where they've been with the Lord. I'm talking to Christians here. I'm talking about those of you that at some point in your life, you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You believe that he died on the cross to atone for your sins. You believe that he rose again on the third day. And there was a moment in your life where you surrendered your life to Jesus and you felt the the refreshment of being a child of God, of being clean, of being forgiven. Maybe even walked with the Lord for a little while. Maybe even served the Lord for a little while. Maybe gave yourself fully to the things of the kingdom. But then you went down into Egypt because a famine hit your life. Troubles rose up. Discouragement came. Disappointment, grief came. Pain, loss You got ambushed by the things of life and whatever happened, you got afraid and you said, man, I I gotta take care of me. I gotta do what I need to do. And you migrated down to your own personal Egypt and there in Egypt, things didn't go the way that you wanted. And maybe the Lord is saying to you today, I haven't given up on you. I'm not even mad at you. I'm not the wrathful, vengeful God that stamps into, stomps into smithereens everybody that takes a little sojourn in Egypt once in a while. I'm the God who loves you too much to live you, leave you in Egypt, but while you're coming back, I want you to come back and remember the altars that you built to me. I want you to remember that that trust was real. That surrender was real. That, that obedience was real, and I want you to come back, and I want you to call upon me today. 
Now, it's a great time of year for all of us to consider where we went in the last year or two through a lot of hardship, a lot of famine in the land, a lot of whistling calling us down to Egypt. And this is the time of year, and I believe as we approach a, a, a brand new calendar year in front of us, I mean, we're already into 2022. Here we are. And I'm asking you, what's going to keep you out of Egypt and keep you kneeling at the altar, the altar at Bethel? To keep you from staying away from Ai, that heap of ruins, and keep you in a place where you're just fixated on the heart of God. Abram had learned that his impatience and his own understanding and his self-will and his fear and his deception and his self-centeredness and that backsliddenness in Egypt, it just all it did was express what life is like out of the will of God and it endangered the people around him. Sometimes I want to say, hey, if you won't do it for you, do it for your family. If you, if you won't do it for you, do it for your kids, do it for your wife, do it for your parents, do it for the, the glory of Jesus. And God graced Abram to escape out of that. And what's amazing to me, for all of you that uh, struggle with the idea that, okay, well, God let me off the hook, so I better make it up to him. I better not expect him to be good to me. I better not expect him to bless me. I better not expect it, there ought to, me to ever have joy or peace or, or, or financial blessing or health or prosperity. You know, we do that. We backslide on God and then we get right. And then instead of coming into the house as a son, we stay out on the front porch like a slave. And the Lord says, no, actually, I went and found you where you were, brought you out, not so you could live the rest of your days on probation, but so that you could be fully restored unto me. Now come sit at my table and dine with me. That's what the Lord does. Religion will put you on probation, but God only deals with pardons. And we have to recognize that. And I, I really feel this like right now, some of you are not in Egypt anymore some of you have recommitted and you're forgiven, but you don't believe you're restored. You, you can say, yes, I am forgiven, but I don't have any right to be restored. Well, let me tell you, the same one that forgives you is the one who restores you. The same price that it took for you to be forgiven was also placed there that you might be restored. And it doesn't honor God for you to stay in this place of a, a, a spiritual purgatory where you're not off in your sin, but you're not living in the glory and the blessing and the fruit of the kingdom. So come on out. Don't bring anything with you. Don't bargain with them. Don't even make any promises. Just bow before that altar that you built once before and say, God, it was real then. You were real then. And today, Lord, I'm believing that you're still real. And here I am again. Third altar. The altar of continuing trust. It's Genesis 13, 8 through 18. From there... Abram moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And here we go. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going, still going, journeying on, still going, still going, still going. You're not done yet. You got to keep moving. There's places for you to go. God's still leading. You're not done. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus Abram and Lot separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after, he had, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward southward, eastward, westward, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. And walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Now pay attention on this one. So Abram and Lot both come up out of Egypt and they've got all this livestock. They, they literally went down, busted and came back blessed. And they literally have so much livestock that they're trying to move Abram's flocks and Lot's flocks into the new territory. And what's happening is the men that work for them, the shepherds of the livestock are, are fighting with each other. It's getting really bad. 
and it's causing friction between Abram and Lot. So a family feud is starting to occur. And Abram is recognizing that the prosperity that they're inheriting is actually potentially going to hurt them spiritually. That's a word, by the way. Listen, most of you can stand easily with the Lord in adversity, but really a, a difficult test of your faith is how are you going to stand with him when he prospers you? Will you still trust him? Will you still need him? Will you still seek him? Will you still serve him? Well, so Abram is recognizing, man, we've got trouble here. Now, Abram's the one with the covenants. Abram's the one with the promises. He's the one with the age. He's got seniority in the family. But Abram does something that is difficult for a lot of people to do. Abram looks at Lot and he says, I tell you what, I don't want to fight with you. I don't want our, our servants to fight. I don't want discord in this family. So Lot, look all throughout the land. Pick the place that you want to go. You go there. I'll go somewhere else. Let's separate so we don't fight. And Lot says, this sounds like an awesome deal. And Lot looks down towards Sodom. And he sees down there a fertile valley. It's plush. It's got plenty of feeding ground. It's a wonderful place to raise the livestock. Plus, it's got a really cool city. It's like Las Vegas, New York, and L.A. rolled into one. A lot of exciting stuff happening down there in Sodom. And so Lot says, I'll take Sodom. I'll take down there in, those, in, those, in that valley and I will take my flocks down there. So in essence, what Lot said is, I'm gonna choose what's best for me. Now, I don't know if you've ever been a place where you did the right thing and you didn't get the, the result that you wanted. Abram was the bigger man. Abram's the one who deferred to Lot. Lot should have honored Abram and said, uncle, you take what's best. Let me go and find my way. God will take care of me. But Lot said, oh, oh thank you. And thank you again, I'll take the best thing for me. Hope it works out for you, Abram. So if I'm Abram, I'm wrestling a little bit. I'm like, Lord, I'm trying to trust you. Lord, I did the right thing. Lord, I humbled myself. Lord, I tried to seek the best welfare for my family. And Lord, my nephew has just taken advantage of my grace and my generosity. And Lord, he did me wrong. So Abram sticks to his guns, and then God moves in. And God says to Abram, I don't want you to miss this. This is the way I picture it. It's not the way it happened, but let me use my sanctified imagination for a moment. God putting his arm around Abram says, hey, I'm proud of you. I know that was tough. I know you did what was difficult, and I know your nephew sold you out a little bit. But come here, walk with me. Abram, I want you to look all throughout the land. Abram, turn around. Look all behind you, all the side. Abram, I want to remind you something. All of the land's still yours, even the part that Lot just took. Look northward, southward, eastward, westward. Abram, don't forget what I promised you. It's all yours. You haven't lost a thing. And there, Abram builds an altar. Some of you have been hurt You've been wounded. You've been taken advantage of. You've been disappointed by people that maybe represent the Lord. It could have been family. It could have been spiritual leaders. It could have been somebody that you've been over backwards to show the love of Jesus to. And as you were bent over backwards, they reached underneath and put a blade in your back. And if you're not careful it can cause something to start brewing within you that says, I'm not going to ever try again. I'm going to change who I am because who I am isn't always appreciated by those around me. I'm not going to lay it on the line anymore because every time I lay it on the line, it hurts. And there's risk with love. And so if I'm called to love, that means I'm called to risk and I'm tired of risking it and it not working out for me. So I'm not going to hate. I'm just not going to love anymore. And Abram might have been leaning towards some melancholy, some frustration, some hurt, some anger, some resentment. But before it could take root in him, even if the seed was there, we don't know that the seed was there. But if it was, Abram wouldn't have been the first or the last to feel a lot of struggle when you do the right thing and it's done wrong. But before he could do it, God just takes him and says, Abraham, you haven't lost a thing. You haven't lost a thing. Lot, by the way, was going to lose everything. Lot chose what he thought was best for him. And Lot ended up losing his family, losing his testimony, losing everything that he ever earned and lived with. And and Abram maintained the inheritance. But there it says, he built an altar to the Lord. 
What do we do with that? Abram was humble in the natural. He was losing. He preferred Lot above himself. He was going low. He was being patient. He was choosing to decrease. And then as he did, he just, and it didn't work out, but he continued on. He continued on. He kept moving. And God reaffirmed the covenant and God renewed the promise. And Abraham became humble and grateful to the extent where he had to say this, this is the time to build another altar unto the Lord. In the, in the, in the valley of my loss, in the pain of my betrayal, when doing the right thing turned out poorly for me temporarily, I'm going to renew my worship. I'm going to reestablish my fixation on the throne. I'm going to give a bigger yes to God, even though Lot has said no to me. I'm not going to let what happens with people separate me from what is happening between me and my God. And so, Lord, right here, right now, I say no to bitterness. I say no to frustration. I say no to anger. I say no to pain. I say no to disillusionment. I'm going to take some rocks. I'm going to build an altar, and I'm going to keep calling on your name no matter what's happened with those around me. And friends, some of you need to do that right now. You need to go ahead and let every regret, every betrayal, every wrongdoing, every heartbreak, every disappointment, let that be a part of your history, not your destiny. You've got, you've got to take ownership of that. You've got to build an altar and say, I don't understand why, but I'm pressing through because God, you're my only hope. And if I move away from you, then I move away from everything. And Abram just raised up some stones. The altar of your continuing trust, the altar of humble recommitment, the altar of initial surrender, and then the last altar. This is the hardest one. And if you haven't come to it yet, you will. And I bless you in the name of Jesus with faith and endurance to go to this altar and finish the work that the Lord's given you there. What is it? It's the altar of deep sacrifice. And this is the altar that was so hard to Abram. Why? Why? because it was the deepest test of his trust and obedience that he had ever experienced. He's 100 years old now. Part of the promise on Abram's life is that he would have a son. He's actually older than 100. At 100, he had this son. He's probably somewhere around 115 years old now. Isaac's not a six-year-old. He's more of a teenager. Isaac's the promised baby boy the one that Abram had waited, the one that it was impossible for him to conceive, yet God touched his body and Sarai's body, and they, they, by natural means, produced this son, Isaac, and it was the son of his love and the son of promise. It was everything to Abram. And one day, God came to Abram, and he said, and, and you can hear it, and listen, just let the Bible say what it says. I don't have to defend God on this. If you're going to wrestle with it, you can wrestle with it. That's fine, but it's not up to me to try to take the edge off of it. It's intense because God came to Abram and he said, I want you to go to a hill that I'm going to show you. I want you to take Isaac up there. I want you to build an altar. I want you to sacrifice your son to me. Abram, I want you to take the dearest thing and I want to see if you'll trust me with it. Now, God knew what Abram would do, but Abram didn't know what Abram would do. And so we read in Genesis chapter 22 that Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Imagine the anguish in Abram's heart when his innocent, naive son, who didn't know what God had called Abram to do. And he says, hey, dad, what are we going to sacrifice up there? Verse number eight says, Abram said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there. And laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then Abram reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. 
But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. You know if you've been to an altar like this. Um, there, there's no pretty well-oiled method to proceed in a moment like this in your life. It's death. It, it's gut-wrenching. It reaches into your deepest part of who you are and your innermost being, and it squeezes Sometimes you can't breathe. And it doesn't go away in a second. And there's a lot of people who say, how can a good God allow anything like that to happen? Doesn't he care? Doesn't he know how I feel? The answer is he knows exactly how you feel because he watched his son die. He watched the one he loved the most be mistreated be abused, be tortured, be dishonored, be denigrated, be lied about, be nailed to a cross naked. They spat on him. God knows exactly what it feels like to lose the thing that's most important. You say, well, why doesn't he stop it? Well, that's a time, that's a discussion for another time, but I can tell you this. Um, the very fact that God went to the extent, because Abraham didn't kill his son. Abraham didn't lose his son. Here's what's amazing in your altar of deepest surrender. It's actually not the thing on the altar that God wants the most. God didn't want Isaac. He just wanted all of Abraham. And guys, we really don't know if our faith is real until we have this altar. We can sing about Jesus. We can preach. We can go to the mission field. We can give a lot of our money. We can serve. We can do whatever we want. But when you hit this altar where the thing in life that you felt like you couldn't go a day without is no longer there, that's where we find out, are we real? Everything up until that moment is hopeful speculation. Maybe we are real, but we don't know it until God says, if you lose it all, am I still good? If you lose it all, will you still praise? If you lose it all, will you still trust? Do you remember what Job said? Because Job lost it all in a way that none of us have. Job looked up at a point where he was not only in the ashes of having lost everything, but he's being accused because he was struggling it. Listen, when people come to this altar, please hold your sermons for a minute. They, they don't need you to tell them how to you know, process the moment. Let the grieving grieve. Let the pain, let the altar that requires everything, it's not a comfortable place. So don't come in with your, you know, your wonderful, lofty, spiritual thoughts and tell them what they ought to be doing. The, the beautiful thing is once you've gone to an altar like this in your life, you know how to help people when they're at that same kind of altar in their life. And Job ended up saying, I'm going to paraphrase, even if God slays me, I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him. So Abram built the altar. Abram laid down the most precious thing on it. And I do believe that that's an important place for your life and mine. And I know it's scary. Listen, this is big boy and big girl Christianity. Lord, help me. I don't have, I, I'm just not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to say amen to the syrupy triumphalism that literally turns God into a magic genie in a bottle who gives you everything you want as soon as you want it and never requires anything of you. 
When Jesus said, actually, if you want to follow me, you have to pick up your cross every day and you have to follow me. Like you have to die to yourself and follow me. And meanwhile, the church in America in the 21st century has taken the truth of the word of God and we preach a sufferless gospel. And then people, when things don't go their way and when they do hurt and when they are struggling and when they do do go to an altar like that and lose everything because we've been taught that if you do the right thing, you'll never have that kind of trouble in your life. And so they're shell-shocked. When our brothers and sisters presently in the world, in different parts of the world, and our brothers and sisters throughout history had a gospel that had within it the concept that, yes, we're going to suffer in this life. We're going to lose in this life. You're going to hurt in this life. But that's not all there is to it. That's a part of it. And for us to say to each other that none of that stuff ever touches us as long as we're behaving properly and in the will of God is just wrong. Jesus was the only perfectly righteous individual. And because he was so righteous, the injustice against him was exponentially greater than anything that you and I might go through. And we are called to follow him as he went. So guys, nobody gets a free pass. And listen, I don't know what your Isaac is. You you might have already been there. And I want you to be afraid of a God who might require that thing. And, And if you have to protect that thing from him, then your trust, listen, I love you, but your trust is lacking. If right now you're saying, oh, anything but that, then that's the Lord's way of saying, I want all of your heart, even that place. And so when all Isaac was laid upon the altar, obviously the Lord said, Abraham, it was a test. It was a test. Don't do anything to the boy. I mean, by the way, Isaac seemingly just trusted his dad too. He didn't fight. Man, that's surrender. That's surrender. Just trusted as he laid on the altar. I trust Papa. I trust my dad. I trust. Isaac gets up off the altar. Pastor Kent, if you'll bring your team. Isaac gets up off the altar and um, they go and find a lamb, a ram was caught in the thorns. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus as our substitute. But when it should have been us on the altar dying under the hand of God, so to speak, God says, no, don't punish the one on the altar. Don't punish the one on the altar. Take him off the altar because I got one whose head is in the thorns and I'm going to lay him in the altar in place of the one that could have died. And it's a picture of Jesus crowned with thorns, laid on the altar called Calvary, who took the full wrath of God. Jesus took the full wrath. The father didn't let his son off the altar because his son on the altar was the hope of all mankind. So Jesus, the substitute, was laid on the altar and he was slain and he did die. But hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, three days later, he emerged from the curse. He emerged from the tomb. He emerged from death. He spoiled the party in hell. Oh, I just want to say that the demons were celebrating. They thought they had done away with the son of God. And then Jesus steps forth from the grave on the third day and uh, the demons of hell dropped their Jack Daniels, put out their blunt and said, what have we done? The party was over. And Jesus steps forth as the supreme resurrected King of kings and Lord of lords so that no matter what else you and I might lose in this life, we know it's not the the last chapter. It's not the last. Listen, we're going to lose some things, but hallelujah. Paul said this, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be fulfilled in us. Temporary losses are going to be part of your story. Will you trust him? Building altars of recommitment need to be a part of some of your story today. Will you build that altar and rededicate? No, straight up rededicate. Come out of Egypt. You're done with that. There's nothing there for you. Come out of Egypt. Come back to the altar at Bethel, the place where God meets with people. 
come there. And then for some of you, continue to build altars as you continue on in your journey. You're not done yet. There's a lot more left for you in the kingdom, a lot more that God wants to reveal, a lot more that God wants to release, a lot more that God requires of us. So we're going to keep pressing on. Would you stand to your feet?